Good evening, everyone. All right. Third time's a charm. So welcome. We're, we're going to get started. I know some folks are still coming in, uh, but we're going to get started. Welcome to BJ and to the fourth and final lecture in our Faith and Public Life lecture series. I'm Shuli Paso. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at the Nage Asher, and delighted to have you all here tonight. Um, as many of you know, we launched this initiative, the Faith and Public Life Initiative, this year uh, in part as a response to the 2016 presidential election and uh, its, let's say, reverberating impact on the American political landscape. And there was a sense at BJ at the time that we needed to kind of do two things in response to what we were seeing in the, in the country. Um, one, that BJ, being a community that was rooted in a, a legacy, a continuing legacy of political and social action, that we needed to continue that legacy, continue to act on uh, our convictions, on a sense of moral responsibility. And at the same time, that there was a deeper schism underlying what we were seeing in this country that required a certain degree of new reflection or new self-reflection um, in order to address what was going on. And Faith in Public Life was born out of, out of that uh, consideration. And I would say that there have been four key questions that have been animating this initiative. One, what is and what has been the role of faith in public life, in social movements, and in the American story? Two, can we build a shared understanding of the current political state, the current political reality? Three, how can religion in general and Judaism specifically help re-knit the torn fabric of today's America? And four, what is BJ's role as a faith institution? And what is each individual's role as a member of BJ in the current political environment? And so I'm not sure if we've fully answered each of these four questions, but we've certainly tried. And over the course of the year, we've sought to respond to them through the various components of the Faith in Public Life Initiative. Some of those being our tzedek minyanim, small groups of BJ members that have come together over the course of the year to act and to study. Some of them have been community calls to action, trying to mobilize our community to raise our voices in the public square on specific issues. In fact, right now you'll see Abigail Moore sitting over on the table with a call to action from our economic justice, Hevra. You can learn how, to, how and why to make calls to Governor Cuomo next week. Uh, we've organized a number of events and trainings and workshops on po current political trends and topics, and we created Bridging the Gap, an exchange that is bringing together BJ members and members of the Michigan Corrections Organization to dialogue across difference. And you've learned a little bit about that, and you'll continue to hear more about that in the weeks ahead. And the backbone of Faith in Public Life has been this four-part lecture series, each one of which each one of each lecture has addressed in some way at least one of the four animating questions. So some of you may have been at all of them. We began in October with Dr. Moshe Halbertal, who offered a Jewish framework for understanding civic responsibility. Deborah Dash Moore joined us in December to provide a window into the history of how Jews and Judaism helped shape New York politics in the 20th century. Our March lecture with Jonathan Haidt from New York University challenged us to consider how our moral and psychological makeup can contribute to ideological rigidity. And tonight, we are really thrilled to welcome for our conclusion Yehuda Kurtzer to continue in this vein with his talk, The Moral, the Political, and the Partisan, Jewish Community and Jewish Values in an Era of Polarization. So before I formally introduce Yehuda and welcome him, I want to remind folks just of our upcoming Faith in Public Life uh, events this Sunday evening, an evening with the journalists uh, Maggie and Clyde Haberman. And our closing Faith in Public Life program on June 12th, we will be hosting a recording of the podcast On Being with Krista Tippett in conversation with U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith as part of Krista Tippett's Civil Conversations Project. So you can see the, the KJ, the Cole Jeshrin at the back table for details on those two events. <laughs> 
And now it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, where he leads the effort of the Institute across the North American Jewish communal landscape and teaches widely in the Institute's many platforms for rabbis, lay leaders, Jewish professionals, and leaders of other faith communities. Yehuda, you have spoken here at BJ a number of times, so some folks may know your bio by heart already, but I'm going to, uh, to just remind people of your credentials so we know that you are a leading thinker and author on the meaning of Israel to American Jews, the value of the Jewish past to the Jewish present, and the questions of leadership and change in American Jewish life. Yehuda received his doctorate in Jewish studies from Harvard University and an MA in religion from Brown University and is an alumnus of both the Bronfman Youth and Wexner Graduate Fellowships. Previously, Yehuda served as a member of the faculty and as the inaugural chair of Jewish communal innovation at Brandeis University. He is the author of Shuva, The Future of the Jewish Past, which offers new thinking to contemporary Jews on navigating the tensions between history and memory and how we can relate meaningfully to our past without returning to it. That sounds good. Uh, Yehuda, I know you've been thinking and writing a lot on the topic that we've been exploring this year at BJ, American Jewish political identity and contemporary concerns related to religion and politics. And so we are very pleased that you are here tonight as a capstone to our public lecture series. Welcome. So first of all, thank you, Shuli. Can you hear me? Yes? Thank you, Shuli, for the introduction and for having me back here. Thank you also, uh, Roly. Uh, the partnership between the Hartman Institute and BJ goes back many years, many decades. And uh, I'm grateful for all of the various iterations of the ways in which we can work together. Uh, what, one of the things that's so exciting about this congregation is the ways in which you always intuit and anticipate the questions that the Jewish people need to be asking, not just in individual congregations, but more broadly. And that, uh, that makes for a wonderful partnership between our institutions. I want to start with a little bit of a personal confession, um, not too revealing, but, but indica indicative of what I want to talk about tonight. On election night, <coughs> uh, the presidential election night of 2016, uh, just about a half an hour before Roly and I started exchanging anxious text messages about the lecture I was supposed to give the following night here at BJ as part of the series on Jewish identity and intermarriage, texts which consisted of, are we sure that we should continue with this lecture series tomorrow night and maybe talk about something else? So about half an hour before that happened, I was watching the election returns come in uh, on, I think, probably MSNBC with my boys who were at the time uh, 8 and 11, I think. And at one point I was, uh, I guess, distracted and starting to get a little anxious. And at one point, and my sons who are learning what it means to be politically active and politically engaged, who we were letting stay up late to watch the election returns come in, who we had spent months talking about all of the various stakes in the American election. Um, and we're paying very close attention to the various returns coming in from the different congressional races. And they kept asking for each one, who are we rooting for in this one? <laughs> so I, you know, um, without the luxury of being able to either do close research on the fourth district uh, in the West Virginia congressional elections, and also because um, I think it actually tells the truth of my own political loyalties, Eventually, I just snapped at them and said, just cheer for blue. <laughs> um, now, I suppose it's not, um, it's not much of a confession uh, here in, a, in, this, in this particular congregation. And actually, I think in most non-Orthodox uh, American congregations, you would probably see a high percentage of population who operates the same way as you watch the election returns come in. It's also not particularly scandalous. We have a binary political system uh, in which we depend on coalitions of those who we broadly agree with uh, in order to see the political outcomes that we want achieved in the world. And, um, and as a result, cheering for one side is a more effective way of seeing your political visions, which are the, which are the encapsulation of much larger moral convictions. Uh, it's reasonable to essentially cheer for one side. 
So I'll give a different confession, which I think is maybe a little bit more problematic. If I really think about it, and if I do the work, and I look back at the Clinton impeachment proceedings, <clears throat> I think in retrospect, I was probably spending more time being scandalized by the impeachment of the president for his various peccadillos and misbehaviors than I was for those peccadillos and misbehaviors uh, themselves. It also put me, and I suspect a lot of Americans, in an uninterrogated, awkward position when the Access Hollywood tape came about, which I think many of us who were cheering that, the, that at the time candidate Trump would lose the election were hoping that this was opportunistically one of the moments that would uh, obviously sink his candidacy for his moral turpitude was now on display more egregiously than all of the ways in which it had already been on display. And I think many of us hope that this would then be a disqualifier from his candidacy for being President of the United States, even though I, and maybe others, had not felt that similar misbehaviors by other presidents, presidential candidates, or political figures had actually really been disqualifiers. In other words, what was disqualifying were the things that we want people to be disqualified for, or the candidates we want disqualified, more than their actual moral failings themselves. Or in other words, <clears throat> my partisan and my political commitments, which I think I come at honestly, and which I think I like to believe are driven by larger moral convictions of what I want for the world and I believe is morally right, um, but those partisan and political commitments shape my moral horizon at least as much as the other way around. I think maybe Jonathan Haidt probably spoke about this as well. We don't always fully interrogate what drives our moral convictions of who we want to be in the world, and we assume that there's a natural continuity between our moral commitments and our political and partisan expressions of those commitments, but sometimes it happens that it comes the other way around. Our political and even our partisan commitments perhaps close off and dictate the shape of our moral universe, what we want to see, what we don't want to see, what we can tolerate, and what we consider um, intolerable. And it limits our capacity to really actually think of ourselves as autonomous moral actors when, if my comment to my sons on election night is true, we are also effectively participants in a massive, if still consequential, game of color war. So even though politics is fundamentally instrumental, right, we sometimes, and it's therefore legitimate to want to participate and partake in the game of politics, to cheer for one side and for root for one team, and even though it's reasonable to imagine that our moral expressions have to find voice in politics and in partisanship, sometimes we become aware of the ways that our moral universe is actually being constrained by our political and our partisan commitments. And what I'm concerned about, and what I'll spend more time tonight trying to figure out how we've got to this point than I will solving for it, if you've come to the talks I've done here before, that is a consistent feature. I'm concerned that we are engaged, especially as Jews, which I'll speak about more about tonight than as Americans. Uh, we'll try to parse apart those differences. I'm concerned that we are engaged in a massive conflation between these discourses, the moral, the political, and the partisan, those are turning from being different discourses in how we understand and map our world and are being totally conflated to effectively being the same thing. And I think as Jews, we do so at our peril. Now, needless to say, these ideas, the moral, the political, and the partisan, are actually on a spectrum. They are related to each other. I don't want to pretend as though they uh, are completely different from one another. Our morals, our values, our commitments of what we think is right and good and what we think is wrong and bad find expression through our political commitments. Right? They find a concretization through our political commitments. And then those political commitments, in turn, are translated into plausible political strategies that we call uh, our partisanship. So these are obviously related to one another. Um, but if you want to you know, capture the fundamental difference between ultimately what is moral and what is partisan, even as they are mediated by the spectrum, even just consider the terms, the difference between political morality and partisan politics. 
Political morality is a wide, big conversation about how do we do what we think is good in the world effectively, and partisan politics is the game of essentially participating in one side of the story. The conflation between these, even though they live on a spectrum, comes with consequences as they are themselves entirely different discourses. Now, in the American context, this is, I, I want to just name the fact that we as Jews are not alone in conflating the moral, the political, and the partisan. Um, Isaiah Berlin is famous for saying Jews are like everybody else, but more so. And in this context, Ameri Jew American Jews are simply playing out larger American trends, but through the particular expressions uh, of Jewish communal life. The Pew study that came out um, from uh, about a year ago about partisanship in America indicated that uh, partisanship is at, a, is at a dramatically different place than it was 20 to 25 years ago. This is a larger story that Americans are participating in. The most astonishing statistic that I was sharing with Shuli beforehand is that uh, the gaps uh, between people of different partisan views as they understand particular issues are dramatically and disproportionately higher on the basis of partisan affiliation than they are on the basis of race, religion, educational background, gender, and age. In all of those places, you can have diversity of, those, um, of all of those categories and a lot more uh, eclecticism in people's viewpoints, but identifying with one partisan position or another creates radically disproportionate difference. And there are a whole variety of theories as to why it is that America has reached this place of um, partisan conflict, not totally unprecedented in our history, but certainly very different than it was a couple of generations ago. A few in particular that I don't want to spend a lot of time on, I'm sure maybe some of the earlier speakers did. The role of the media, the algorithms of social media, and the ways that those media curate the viewpoints that corroborate the previously existing positions. Right? This is, and Jonathan Haidt is one of the leading thinkers on this. The Facebook algorithm, like it, don't like it, is designed to do one thing, which is to keep people on the site. <clears throat> and when you confront counter data to things that you hold to be true and belief systems that you think are fundamentally wrong, one of the things that our brain will incline us to do is to reduce that dissonance and reduce that tension by simply closing the browser window. And so the algorithm is designed to curate the news and information that is going to support one's previously existing views of the world. Wall Street Journal did an incredible thing on this after the election, just putting side by side how Republicans and Democrats viewed the exact same news stories based on what was being curated for them by the algorithms whose main goal is the profit margin of people keeping people connected to the site. The question of urgency may be another driver, the belief that um, the issues that we're facing are more consequential and moving quicker um, than we've ever experienced before. Not sure that's actually true or whether we simply have more access to information about all the different pieces of the political culture that we belong to, which amplifies the anxiety that we have in terms of how we respond and perhaps gravitates us towards identifying with teams as opposed to having to figure out what do I actually believe about all 75 of these issues which seem to be politically significant. And I guess the larger American trend, and, and there are probably more, are growing trends of geographical and ideological siloing. This is a fascinating and weird thing, um, but there is actually some geographic data that people are moving towards uh, communities, actually physically moving towards communities uh, of ideological affinities. Um, it's increasingly true, uh, I can say anecdotally, I, I hear this from rabbis in the Jewish community, we'll talk, about, talk more about that later, of it's actually increasingly possible to live both online and in live communities entirely surrounded by people who broadly share your political positions, and over time that will, seek, that will, that will have the consequences of reinforcing um, deeply held ideological beliefs. So American Jews are just Americans. But there are some ways and some specific risks with real consequences for this hyper-partisan culture on Jewish identity. And here are, I think, let's see, I think like six. Six big consequences for Jewish life that come out of this conflation between the moral, the political, and the partisan. The first is the one that I indicated already, which is that it's morally corrosive. <clears throat> 
When you lose sight of your moral indices, those um, main commitments that you think are the definers of good and bad, because they are subordinate to what is politically useful, it's inconvenient for the senator who's helping you to hold a particular seat to be also caught up in the Me Too moment when you want only the president to be caught up in the Me Too moment, you are no longer um, actually talking about your moral commitments. You are pretending as though you're being driven by your moral commitments, but what you have effectively done is moved the moral commitments already one step down the line. <laughs> My politics become expressions of my moral commitments rather than the moral commitments themselves. The other thing is the more likely, um, the more urgent your political needs, the more likely it is that you will traffic in whatever you need to do to get your political objectives uh, achieved. And this is the great and I think morally compromising conflation between ends and means. The minute that that happens and we say, whatever means are necessary to achieve this moral outcome, we are not anymore holding ourselves accountable to the primary instrument of what morality is supposed to do, which is to create a compass for ourselves. We are simply willing to do whatever it takes in order to produce the outcome that we want. Uh, from a Jewish standpoint, and I'll talk more about this later, I think the minute that the Jewish people start reducing our moral commitments and our moral integrity, which have been one of the hallmarks of the tradition and the story we have told ourselves, to, ver to specific political outcomes for the societies in which we want to live, then we are no longer playing with the same raw materials that define what it means to be Jewish. And here, I think, is issue number two, which is we risk trivializing Judaism to be entirely defined by its political expressions. Now, what I'm not saying, um, and I have my friend and colleague, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, um, hovering over here. <laughs> um, what Jill has said for years, and I think is right, is that Judaism and the Torah are fundamentally political. Of course they are. Um, the commitment to a visions of societies that try to produce equity and equality um, is, a is a fundamentally political document. So I am not claiming that by Judaism playing in this political and partisan territory, it's somehow becoming something it's not supposed to be. But on the other shoulder, I hear uh, a senior reform colleague who said to me recently, I went to the reform biennial and I couldn't tell the difference between the biennial and the Democratic National Convention, except for periodic splashings of the word God and not enough. <laughs> uh, and suddenly, there is, an, there is an awareness that we have to start to internalize that the more that our, um, what we describe as our public Judaism correlates entirely to our political commitments, we may not be talking about Judaism anymore, except as decorative window dressing on the set of political commitments that precede it, or worse, the instrumental technology of our ideas and identities that are supposed to advance a political vision for the world. And I need not say, it is not simply true on the left, it is equally true on the right. A third big issue, I think, for Jewish life is the simple impossibility of community and Jewish peoplehood. The minute that you conflate your partisan enemy, that person who you're hoping to defeat, with your moral enemy, you cannot actually coexist in community together with them. The speed by which we turn our, our partisan and even our political enemies into our moral enemies betrays that fundamentally we are narrowing and limiting the, the basis of who we actually think is legitimate to be part of our community because by definition, people who you define as morally other than you, not ethnically other, not politically other, but morally other, constitute a deep existential threat to how your own self-definition and definition of your group might be. And what's amazing about the speed by which we do this, of uh, the willingness to actually classify people as moral others, is that it is counterbalanced by the counterfactual of Jewish history, which is the ways in which we as a people for a long time have lived comfortably in community, including at Shabbat tables and at Thanksgiving and at Pesach seders with all sorts of people who have radically different worldviews than us, but who we have found ways, larger technologies of community and peoplehood, to understand that those commitments are not so transcendent as to constitute um, total and radical moral otherness.
Another concern, I think, for, for Jewish life of the conflation between the moral and the political and the partisan, it's not like a comfortable thing to say out loud, because if you say this out loud and you're an anti-Semite, it, sound anti it sounds anti-Semitic. Um, the, the more that Jews traffic in these types of partisan distinctions, it actually reduces Jewish power. Right, it sounds anti-Semitic. Um, uh, the more we, tra we traffic in these types of commitments, we reduce access to Jewish power. Uh, Abe Foxman had an amazing line in the, in the lead up to the 2008 presidential election in which he said when, um, when the Republican Jewish coalition refused um, an effort by the AJC and the ADL offered together to try to keep Israel from being a third rail uh, issue in, lead up, in the lead up to the 2008 presidential election, the Republican Jewish coalition laughed. They were like, we think in candidate Obama, this is our opportunity to bring Jews over to the Republican party because we perceive him as being soft on Israel. This was pr prior to him becoming president. Foxman said in response, this moment signals the end, I can't believe he said it on the record, this moment signals the end of Jewish soft power in America. Our capacity to actually wield um, a, a certain type of influence which exceeds our small percentage of our population depended on our capacity to understand that we are fundamentally allies with other Jews about major issues of Jewish concern. Of course, this belies that the whole story of airing our dirty laundry in public is an old story. It's not true anymore. But the core commitment that we can actually hold together with a certain narrative of Jewish power is much more powerful when we actually try to do that than we essentially relinquish it and become simply Jewish Democrats and Jewish Republicans. And perhaps what's most concerning and remarkable, I mean, this is like an incredible accomplishment of the American Jewish community and experience, is the partisanization of anti-Semitism. This I feel like we should congratulate ourselves on having lived to see this. Um, the, way, the ways in which the one core commitment that held together Jews throughout Jewish history was never religion, it was never culture, it was never denomination, it wasn't the same foods, it wasn't rice on Passover. The core commitment that held the Jewish people together was understanding that behold or vador in every generation there rise up people who want to kill us and they're gonna be there all along and our core commitment to one another is some shared ethic and discourse of survival against the anti-Semites. And what we have discovered in the past couple of years in America is that if you are a Republican, the anti-Semites who you are scared of and who you are passionate about are the anti-Semites associated with the Democratic Party. And if you are a Democrat, the anti-Semites who you are concerned about and who you will work to defeat are the anti-Semites connected to the Republican Party. In other words, we are fighting anti-Semitism because it is instrumental to our political goals in America and because it is convenient to identify anti-Semites with our opponents rather than those on our side. And this, I feel, is a massive Jewish communal race to last place. Everybody loses. And this is an incredible accomplishment as a result of this conflation between the moral and the partisan that we actually have lost the single organizing discourse of what some self-respect is for the Jewish people in understanding the possibility that we actually have some enemies. And the last piece, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in trying to understand where that we've come to this, is that, um, and it connects to the anti-Semitism piece, is that in general, we're witnessing a radical disruption in Jewish communal life in the reorganizing of subgroups, the loss of denominational frameworks to hold together Jews and the replacement with political and partisan ones. Um, who, you know, this was an amazing moment a few years ago when a evangelical congressman speaking to a group of J Street U students called them anti-Semites. Amazing. Right? Just as a historical moment, I'm not describing it as, it's not good. It's amazing as a historical moment of like, who are the friends of the Jews and who are the enemies of the Jews is now classified entirely in political terms. If you stand on this issue relative to the state of Israel, if you stand on this issue relative to the Trump administration, you are my ally and friend, independent of all of the rest of your commitments and independent of what that actually does to any construct of what community had meant. So if I was gonna list all of the various conflations that this does, that this moment brings about for us, it's the conflation between ends and means, the conflations between messages and messengers, 
right? Moral messages versus moral messengers. Between instrumental allies and existential partners, for more and more of us as political actors, those people who we are allies with instrumentally are becoming our existential friends, and the other Jews who we don't agree with politically are now becoming our enemies. And I think most damagingly, moral rectitude has been conflated with political strategy. The argument I want to offer tonight, and I have some sources to, to work through together with you, is um, a little bit about where I think this came from for the Jewish people. And the argument will make two central claims. That the 20th century has entailed two big moves for the Jewish people in relationship to politics. One, that we have over-centralized the political. We have made the political as a result of all sorts of interesting phenomena in the 20th century, the most central discourse to what it means to be a Jew is political. And the second is that we have internalized the political as the dominant feature of Jewish identity. In other words, so it's central um, in communal life, and it has been internalized as the dominant feature of individual identity. And at the end, after I walk through some of where I think this has come from, I want to offer some thoughts on what we might think about doing differently as a result. But just to get a window into a little bit of the difference between a pre-modern understanding of the relationship between Jews and politics and Jews and the state, I want to look at this wonderful little Gemara, this wonderful rabbinic text um, from Tractate Me'ila 17a. It is a mess of a text. Um, I cut off before it gets really weird. Um, but I want to share just a little bit of a political window into a rabbinic understanding of the relationship between the Jew and the state and the Jew and the political. The rabbis tell the story as follows. For the government had once issued a decree that they, the Jews, should not keep the Sabbath, they should not circumcise their children, and that they should have intercourse with menstruant women. This is a very specific Roman decree. Um, it's a very learned Roman decree, which seems to understand that there are three great differentiators that the Jewish people use to preserve their identity and diaspora, which are in uh, the keeping of the Sabbath, um, the laws of circumcision, and, refrain, and refraining from having sex with their wives when they are menstruating, um, the Jewish men. Um, and this government decree comes along and says, we want to prohibit all of these things, or in the case of, um, of having sex with menstruant women, demand that they do. So what does a Jew do politically to respond to a moment of this decree? And I want you to listen to the psychology of the relationship understood between Jews in power and Jews in the state. The instinct that one does in pre-modern understandings of what the relationship is to Jewish politics is to figure out who do we know and what could they do to infiltrate the system in order to be able to work the problem from the inside? We could spend the whole, the whole night tonight talking about the fourth chapter of the book of Esther. That is the dominant story. Who do we got? Who, to whom is owed a favor? Um, and who has actually infiltrated the system by pretending that they're not actually Jewish? So in this case, it's the story of an otherwise unknown rabbi Thereupon, Rabbi Ruvain, son of Istroboli, who has this um, Greek-sounding name, so he's like, um, he can probably work the system because he's a Greek-speaking Jew. He's like really Roman. I tried to figure out what this word actually means in Greek. Couldn't really figure it out. It means like whirling, like a whirling dervish, so I think it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter, just like he's Greek-sounding. Um, he cut his hair in the Roman fashion, so he disguises himself to look like he actually belongs, and he went and sat among them. I like to imagine that he maneuvered his way into public office. He said to them, the Romans, if a man has an enemy, what does he wish him, to be poor or rich? They said that he be poor. He said to them, if so, let them, the Jews, do no work on the Sabbath so that they grow poor. What's the, what's the strategy here? How do I make sure that anti-Semitism that's being played out by the Roman regime is actually not in their interest? <laughs> I could sell these guys, I can't convince them that they should like the Jews, but what I can convince them that doing these things for the Jews will actually help their self-interest of ultimately being bad for the Jews altogether. They said, he speaks rightly, let this decree be annulled. Okay, success. It was indeed a null. Then he continued, if one has an enemy, what does he wish him, to be weak or healthy? They answered, weak. 
He said to them, then let their children be circumcised at the age of eight days and they will be weak. They said he speaks rightly and it was annulled. Finally, he said to them, don't get hung up on the biology of this following sentence. It's, it is what it is. If one has an enemy, what does he wish him to multiply or to decrease? They said to him that he decreases. If so, let them have no intercourse with menstruant women. They said he speaks rightly and it was an old. <laughs> it's my favorite line in the whole thing. Later they found out he was a Jew and they were reinstituted. <laughs> this is an amazing text for a few reasons. One of which is, we'll get to some of the other reasons, but think about like, um, the way in which Jews sell their interests to the Roman imperial forces is through trying to align them as in the interest of the empire, but ultimately, even that falls short to a larger and prevailing assumption that this text has about the relationship between the Jew and the state, which is that the Jew fundamentally is an outsider and is so fundamentally hated by whatever society and civilization he or she is located in that at a certain point, that's state self-interest will give way to that pathological hatred that will ultimately result that the Romans are willing to actually do things that are not in their own self-interest in order to simply slam down the door on, on Jewish legitimacy. And so then the rabbis ask, okay, who is going to go and nullify the decrees? And they come to option two, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who doesn't do politics. He does what? Miracles. And then the remainder of the story, which is a completely weird text, is the way in which he maneuvers his way into the system, performs a miracle, and as a result of performing a miracle for the emperor's daughter, there's all sorts of laden sexual imagery there too, the performance of the miracle for the emperor's daughter results in a favor, and the favor he asks for is to annul the decrees. I want to just notice, um, again, Jews are external to these political structures. Jews need instruments of assimilation in order to get in, like, for instance, being able to speak the language and being able to get the appropriate haircut. And most of all, Jews are fundamentally vulnerable to the vicissitudes of empire. What's amazing about this text is that it doesn't tell us any reason why the Romans suddenly decided to ban circumcision, ban the keeping of Shabbat, except for the assumption that Jews are simply and fundamentally others. As a result, much of Jewish history, not entirely, I'm not, not buying the idea that everything, is, um, everything was bleak and dark through most of Jewish history, but one of the dominant stories that Jews told about our relationship to the state was one in which we would think about power instrumentally. Can we get access to this system in order to be able to do what we needed to do in order to advance our interest? The Jew does not experience any sort of profound at-homeness. And most important for our purposes, there's no indication in this story that the Jew would ever conflate the norms and values of Jewish life with the norms and values of what one does politically. <laughs> Politics is a totally depersonalized and externalized discourse, right? My norms and values are here. I will do all sorts of things in that system to advance my norms and values, but I would never mistake the politics of what I do as the expression of my norms and values. Rabbi Ruvain of Estroboli acts politically on behalf of the Jewish people not because he thinks that being a Roman senator is the ultimate articulation of what it means to be a Jew. What it means to be a Jew is to be a Jew. And I will act politically through whatever systems I need in order to advance that interest. The 20th century, I think, uh, suggests to us the awareness of the basic problem of a lack of Jewish power and the, the basic awareness of a lack of Jewish at-homeness. By the end of the 19th century, the story of the Jewish problem, the recognition that the discourse of emancipation was never what it was cracked up to be. We thought emancipation for the Jewish people was gonna be the solution to our problems, and lo and behold, by the end of the 19th century, the great pogroms, the indicator that it was never what we thought it was going to be. And therefore, we needed a different solution, a different set of technologies by which the Jewish people would acquire actual power, and ideally some technologies which we ultimately called Zionism in which Jews could create some discourse of at-homeness to help to correct this essentially immutable problem that the Jewish people had throughout its history. 
To give one example, this incredible short piece by Franz Rosenzweig, which is the third text, I'll come back to, um, I'll come back to Achara Am in a second. Rosenzweig writes in 1920 as part of his essay towards a renaissance of Jewish learning, an incredible summary of the Jewish problem as he understands it, where he says, what then holds us or has held us together since the dawn of emancipation? In what does the community of our contemporary life show itself, that community which alone can lead from the past to a living future? The answer is frightening. Since the beginning of emancipation, only one thing has unified the German Jews in a so-called Jewish life, emancipation itself, the, str the Jewish struggle for equal rights. Rosenzweig is, um, is arguing that that's the organizing principle of Jewish life. The organizing principle of Jewish life is to have a politics that actually rescues us from the political conditions that you're in. What I'm going to get to is this worked. We succeeded as the Jewish people by the end of the 20th century and now in the beginning of the 21st of making politics and power the central discourse of Jewish meaning. At the same time, what Rosenzweig is anticipating is that that's a good project until you have power, and then it is a totally morally vacuous discourse once you actually have it. Rosenzweig in this context is a prophet, as he says in the next paragraph. Zionism, diagnostician of genius, but most mediocre healer. In another lifetime, I dream of like incredibly esoteric Jewish bumper stickers, and that's like one of them. Um, <laughs> has recognized the disease but prescribed the wrong treatment. What is recognized was the absence of specific contemporary Jewish life having some common characteristics. Then it's not just the possession of a dead scholarship and a common defense against anti-Semitism. We need something else Zionism demanded of us. We need some condition to transform the existential conditions of the Jewish people. What Zionism also recognized, and here proved itself to be a pathologist and not merely a diagnostician, is, that, um, is this, that the only healthy, the only whole thing about the Jewish person is the Jewish person himself. It cannot be emancipation alone that's supposed to organize us. It cannot simply be fighting anti-Semitism that's, that's supposed to define the characteristic of what the Jewish people and Judaism is fundamentally about. As I was thinking about this today, it dawned on me um, how crude Hatikva is as the national anthem of the State of Israel. How crude it is that the only thing Hatikva asks of us, at least in the paragraphs that we sing, is to be a free people in our land. All Hatikva demands of us is the political opportunity of freedom. None of, and we'll get to this a little later, none of the demands that we as the Jewish people stand for something, believe in something that transcends the mere, polit the mere opportunity that is created by um, political possibility. And here, in the early 20th century, the same theorists who were talking about this as the Jewish problem, all we have is emancipation and it's not working, were aware that at the same time as we are longing for power and longing for at-homeness, they are aware in the early 20th century of the risk of corruption, that that would become the totalizing principle of what Jewish community and identity were about, that if the Jewish people are going to have a politics, if there's going to be such a thing as Jewish politics, that Jewish politics is going to wind up making us into something we do not want to be that that's going to wind up moving us from our core moral, religious, spiritual, theological convictions and ultimately evacuate all of those convictions and replace them with politics themselves. And here I want to read from uh, another prophet of the 20th century, Arendt. Arendt writes in 1943, she has now by this point come to, um, come to America. She's been rescued by Vary and Fry and together with other Jewish intellectuals um, during the war, had left Germany by the early 30s, stateless for about 15 years, and comes to America, and is furious at the Jewish leadership in Europe for failing to organize. This was a conviction that Arendt had it did not make her popular during the war or afterwards for indicting the failure of the Jewish people to organize politically, in this case, to actually build a Jewish army that would fight against Hitler. And instead, what she felt Jewish politics had become entirely, um, to her perspective, um, transactional and weak. 
So here, Arendt, like Rosenzweig, is looking for, we need some solution to the Jewish problem. We need something that, we need to activate some Jew Jewish political sensibilities in moments like this. There's no idealization here in the 20th century of a discourse of powerlessness. That's not what this is about. But it is a recognition that at the same time that you are trying to build a Jewish politics, that there is a risk that those Jewish politics are gonna become the totality of what you're about. Arendt writes, um, her whole, whole opening paragraph is an amazing run on sentence, if the horrible catastrophe of European Jewry and the difficult, sad struggle to form a Jewish army and to gain recognition of the Jews as an ally of the United Nations result in our finally realizing that despite our millionaires and philanthropists, we Jews are among the oppressed peoples of this earth and that our Rothschilds have a better chance of becoming beggars or peddlers than our beggars and peddlers of becoming Rothschilds. If, in other words, this war politicizes us and pounds us into our heads that the struggle for freedom is tantamount to the struggle for existence, then and only then will our grandchildren be able to remember and mourn the dead and live without shame. If we are going to have one lesson from the downtroddenness experienced in the Holocaust, it's going to be that we will figure out of the urgency of a politics that produces our survival. At the same time, as Arendt goes on to say, this is a remarkable paragraph on the top of page four of the handout. She is fearful that the politicization of Judaism, which has to come about, is going to wind up producing politics of the worst kind. And just read this. The politics that grows out of this mentality is called realpolitik. So you see Arendt is differentiating between Jewish politics, which are noble, and realpolitik, which is horrible. Its central figures are the businessman who winds up being a politician convinced that politics is just a huge oversized business deal <laughs> with huge oversized wins and losses, and the gangster who declares, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver. Once abstract ideas had been replaced by concrete stock market speculation, it was easy for abstract justice to give way before concrete revolvers. What looked like a rebellion against all moral values has led to a kind of collective idiocy. Anyone who can see farther than the tip of his own nose is said to live in a fantasy world. What looked like a rebellion against intellect has led to organized turpitude, might makes right. So first of all, just for that paragraph, like Dayenu, right? I mean, just, I feel like this is, it's unbelievable. What she has correctly intuited is that when politics and winning become the essential discourse of a group's identity, the version of politics you're gonna get are gonna be the crudest reflection and manifestation of this issue. The story of 1948 and the Jewish people's arrival in homeland parallels in many ways the story for the Jewish people in America of our arrival in homeland as well. This is something that I don't think we as American Jews admit quite as much as we should. American Jews are at home and act at home. And perhaps the best site at which we do this is in the context of Jewish politics, where we no longer live in the story of Babylonian Talmud tractate Me'ilah, Jews who run for office do so not because they are looking to simply be representatives on behalf of their particular community of Jews within the political structure. Jews run for office in America because that's what it is to be an American. That is what it is to be an ambitious American. Jews who run for office recognize that their constituents are those who vote for them and not particularly the Jewish community itself. The fundamental shift for Jews as a result of the story of at homeness, both in the state of Israel and in America, has been the foregrounding of the political as the expression of the at homeness. We have centralized power and politics as the core activity of Jewishness because we saw by the end of the 20th century and by the middle of the 20th century that the absence of emancipation and the absence of power were non-starters for the capacity of the Jewish people to do anything. The system of emancipation fails in Eastern Europe precisely because it doesn't allow Jews to actually acquire power, precisely because it doesn't actually allow Jews to become fundamentally at home. We recognize that the central corrective that the Jewish people need is a story of at-homeness and a facility, a faculty, a participation in a discourse of power and politics that we, we view as essential to Jewish survival. But in turn, we have also now internalized politics and power as the core discipline of Jewishness 
and the most important transacted commodity. When you're an outsider in the political system, you will think about politics as transactional. When you are an insider in the political system, you traffic differently with the commodity of power and politics as what you think to be the central expression of your values. State of Israel, a remarkable story for the Jewish people, in, entailed fundamentally the elimination of the boundary between the private and the public as Jewish concerns. Great news. We, the Jewish people, are now in charge of a public square. We are tested by whether we can do right by a public square. But are we interested anymore in the, that arbitrary, in that, that old division where the moral lives in the framework of family and in community and the public is viewed as separate and threatening? It disappears. And I would argue that it has disappeared for all intents and purposes for American Jews as well. We find so many expressions of this. I gave you, for instance, my colleague Shaul Magid's short essay, which I'm not going um, to read aloud, um, who argues that pro-Israelism has, in many cases, evacuated Jewish culture and content for, as a defining element of what it means to be a secular Jew. The example that Shaul uses a lot, which I'll quote here in his name, is the remarkable situation in which a Jewish cultural institution, the Jewish Museum, invites a Jewish cultural critic, Judith Butler, to give a talk on a Jewish cultural subject, Kafka, and then ultimately rescinds the invitation, not because in any way the, re the invitation or the recension had anything to do with Jewish culture or secular identity, but because of Butler's politics on Israel-Palestine. Now, regardless of whether you th what you think of the original invitation or the rescinding of the invitation, Sometimes in moments like this, we display that the core commitment um, is expressed in how we act. And if we have effectively and functionally decided that our core Jewish commitment is about a loyalty oath to one particular side of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we are implicitly messaging that we are no longer using a defining moral instrument of Jewishness that is anything other than our particular political commitments. Prophecy of Rosenzweig, Achad Ha'am, who alludes to this as well, and Arendt, is that when politics become the center of an identity, it makes for a corrosive fixation in all of the um, aforementioned crudenesses. Now here it's interesting because I wonder, to all of this critique, whether still people who identify as being not Trump people um, might still say, I still choose the other. <laughs> I would rather win and for this to be terrible. I would rather, Yehuda, that you be right in your diagnostic of why this, is, why this partisanship is ultimately bad for the Jewish people, but I still would rather win politically than encounter these consequences. But let's consider really what the costs are of winning. Trading Jewish communal life for a new community shaped by political affinities, replacing Jewish values with Jewish platforms, and really the loss of the multivocality of Jewish tradition. How often, in the context of when we hear Jewish leaders speak about political viewpoints, do they present all of those texts in our tradition that don't line up that well with whatever political campaign we actually want to advance? The Beit Midrash facilitates dialogue, difference, dissent, um, because all of those ideas are part of how a robust tradition navigates its core questions. A political community simply sources the versions and pieces of its Jewish tradition that is convenient for advancing its vision of the world and then constructs its ideology as a result. I have some, um, and, and, and finally, who become our leaders? We have an enormous number of rabbis, communal leaders, who are people who committed to Jewish life because they felt that Judaism had a wisdom on defining moral questions that transcended simply our political commitments. Those people in many circles are becoming less consequential Jewish leaders and by far viewed less as the exemplars of Jews in America than are our political leaders who come on different parties and represent much more doctrinal and dogmatic political views. Again, you may want them to win, but what becomes the ultimate character of the Jewish people as the result of winning um, needs to be uh, considered. Last couple of comments. I want to provide maybe another bit of a little vision of what, my, what, me, what we might do differently. The first is, 
what would a, an American Jewish covenant between ourselves, uh, between our communities look like that hinged on a transcendent set of American Jewish values that we aligned with that were not easily caricatured and could not be easily reduced to concrete political uh, or even more limitedly partisan positions. Ideas that, as much as they sound naive, have actually been a core feature of the American Jewish experience from the beginning, like liberty and freedom and justice and democracy. What if, that, what if those become the core principles for an American Jewish moral discourse about the context in which we're in, as opposed to a partisan one? If you do the work a little bit, you discover that both right and left are extremely concerned in America right now about freedom of speech. They just see the constraints on freedom of speech being put in place differently. B the BDS movement is a great example to this effect. Both, the, both folks um, who are trying to shut down the BDS movement on campus, who usually come from the right, and others who are anxious about the rules being put in place that block the BDS movement from speaking are actually both concerned about freedom of speech. They just have villainized and demonized the opponents of speech in ways that correlate to their viewpoints. Here too, I know you're experiencing this when you talk to the folks in Michigan, where the difference between how someone might caricature opponents of gun control versus people who believe in gun rights oftentimes hinges on totally different understandings of liberty, but no greater conviction on one side or another about what, are the, what is the nature of liberty fundamentally and in what ways it constitutes a core moral value. Even their issue of immigration is oftentimes caricatured by opponents or, or proponents um, on, on exactly opposite terms as it relates to core moral commitments. How do we move a conversation among Jews and between Jews back to core moral commitments on which we agree as opposed to partisan political expressions on which we don't? Second, there are those who argue that, a help, that, a, that some partisanship is actually, um, is actually healthy for democracy and I agree. I am not trying to argue for some sort of toothless bipartisanship for centrist politics, I don't buy it. However, there is a certain point when disagreement on partisan terms turns from being actually a healthy Jewish value. We are a people who values in deep ways what dissent is supposed to look like. You could count countless rabbinic texts on these and these are the words of the living God. Right? We have all of that material. We're good at that. There is a point at which the demonization and delegitimization of other viewpoints makes a culture of elu ve'elu fundamentally impossible, in part because our tradition did not merely say these and these are the words of a living God. It said two other things as well. It said halacha kebet hilel. One position actually has to be normative. It didn't say we tolerate this indefinitely. It said you can be really committed to your view of the world and you have to tolerate that not, not, not the viewpoint that you disagree with is also that of, is in, encompasses in some ways God's will. And in order to do that, both positions have to assume some basic epistemological humility. I may be right temporarily, I may be right conditionally, I may be right instrumentally, but I never make a normative claim about a political viewpoint that transcends any of those um, fundamental constraints. Ideas like even publishing the dissent, which our Supreme Court embodies for us, but our Jewish organizations do not, um, involve actually the same political problem. Publishing the dissent is good for democracy telling people what's the strongest articulation of the viewpoint that we are rejecting enables people to identify, oftentimes people who are angry at organizations for taking a particular view are not actually angry at the outcome, they are angry that their view was not heard. When the Supreme Court publishes the dissent, it signals it is not that we consider these ideas to be illegitimate, it's just that they did not currently win. And in that way, there are many theorists who argue that it is better for democracy to have a 5-4 vote in the Supreme Court than a 9-0 vote. A 9-0 vote says we can't even countenance the possibility that someone would disagree with this position. That there's a certain justice in democracy in actually legitimating and licensing 
the viewpoints that lose. And finally, I, I, I'm not trying to argue for, as I said, a toothless centrism. I don't want Jews to be any less political, and I want blue to win. <laughs> I'll be honest about that, I do. I simply want to interrogate the divide that we are creating between the moral, the political, and the partisan, and to try to figure out whether ways that simply cheering for one team does not constitute the totality of our moral identities. And I'll conclude with this one last text that's here on the bottom of page five. This is a Hartman Institute classic, if you've been to a Hartman program before. Kind of an astonishing little story of a rabbi and the rabbi's disciples. Incidentally, this particular rabbi, I'm not a fan of his politics from a whole bunch of other stories, but I am a fan of his moral integrity. Shimon ben Shetach traded in cotton. His students said to him, Master, allow us to buy you a donkey so you will not have to work so much. This is what a student does for their teacher. Let me create conditions that you could spend your time really teaching Torah and not have to do the work of, um, of, uh, of all of this cotton labor. So they went and bought him a donkey from a certain Syriac, a Syrian man, and found upon it a precious stone. They came and told him, now you don't have to work ever again. Right? We found, lo and behold, we bought this donkey, and uh, it came with this precious gemstone, now you're rich. Said he, why so? They replied, we have bought you a donkey from a certain Syriac and found upon it a precious stone. He asked, but does the owner know about it? They replied, no. And he told them, go and return it. This is the first end of the text and then you have additional layers of this text that get added on. The first conviction of this text is that Shimon ben Shetach requires no explanation for his actions because, and I think this is one of the most noble ideas in our tradition, the moral conviction, the, the primacy of the ethical is privileged and it resists all of the contextualization and all of the particular framework and all of the context don't ignore the ethnicity of the guy who sold the donkey. <laughs> it's not about that. There is a certain primacy of the ethical that is simply about how do you want to act in the world, regardless of whether the conditions of how other people are acting might dictate how you think you're supposed to act in the world. You are defined first and foremost by whether you feel that you have a sense of doing hayashar v'hatov, what is good and what is right. But then the text adds two other arguments. First, the Talmud asks, wait, isn't there a legitimate argument that he might have for keeping the stone? And it's amazing. The text that they quote is from Rav Huna Bibi Bar Gazlan, whose name literally means Rabbi Son of a Thief. <laughs> didn't, didn't thief rabbi say that you're allowed to steal things? <laughs> um, Quoting Rav, it was stated in the presence of Rabbi Judah the Prince, even according to the view that stealing from a heathen is forbidden, appropriating his lost property is permitted. This is one of the grossest questions in all of rabbinic literature. Okay, I, even if you agree that you shouldn't steal from a Gentile, which this text is basically saying, I'm not sure I agree with that, but even if I agree with that, I should certainly be allowed to just appropriate his lost property. In other words, the introduction of the contextual who is this person? Am I allowed to actually manipulate them and take advantage of them? Am I allowed to sublimate what, what my moral conviction is in order to be able to achieve a particular outcome? Even according to that position, and the first answer the Talmud gives is, what do you think, Shimon Bat Shetach is a barbarian? You think that this is about resolving a halachic dispute? This is about who are you? Barbarian is an amazing word to use here because the barbarian is the term used by the Romans to differentiate themselves from those who couldn't speak their language. The Jew who is part of a city, who is part of a civilization, identifies with the moral fabric of that civilization. More than they identify with their own political loyalties, they identify with that civilization, and they refuse to be held hostage by the worst instincts um, that their political circumstances might dictate them to do. And then the text concludes with a final answer. Shimon ben Shetach preferred hearing, blessed be the God of the Jews to all the riches of the world. Not only was this the morally re responsible way to act in the world, but it also results in a Kiddush Hashem. <laughs> it also winds up resulting in the sanctifying of God's name. 
What this creates is that the Jewish people strive to be exemplars through our moral behavior that requires of us periodically the divorcing from the political instrumental context in which we want to be Jewish in order to be the Jewish people we want to be in the world. I, I know this is harder to do in practice than it is in theory. I know my articulation of the challenge is more significant than the broad strokes with which I paid, painted um, the answer. I've tried to argue tonight why I think hyper-partisanship hyper um, as a replacement of a moral discourse is bad for the Jews. I tried to suggest that I think this is a product of, um, of certain political ideologies from the beginning of the 20th century that, that then get reinforced by the Jewish political experience both in America and Israel throughout the 20th century. And I want to suggest in closing that the work to do around cultivating an epistemological humility about our politics, um, the work uh, around um, identifying the ways that our discourse actually implicates us, and ultimately challenging us to really figure out how we as a community focus on what is considered to actually be our moral core, may be some of the technologies that we use to get out of this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Yehuda. Uh, we're going to open it now for a few minutes of q and I'm going to ask, um, ask people, cajole, remind, encourage, plead, beg, uh, to ask questions um, rather than uh, offer statements. Um, thank you. That was an extraordinary talk. Um, where I have trouble figuring out how to walk the walk of what you said is I do think there are some of us who are really looking at the moral underpinnings of some of our partisan beliefs. Um, you know, I think about the issue of abortion and conversations I've had with people who hold diametrically opposite positions for me about abortion. And each of us articulates those positions in moral terms. Yeah. And we like each other when we leave those conversations, yeah. but we are no closer at all to figure out how to maneuver the chasm between us. And yeah. in terms of the Jewish community as a whole, and I'm Yisroel, I think there are moral sensibilities that are profoundly different. So if we go in your direction and we try to sort of walk back the politics to the moral fiber, I wonder if it's really going to help us move forward together. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a... <clears throat> I, I, not only I understand that concern, I identify with it as well. Um, I fear oftentimes that what I'm talking about is either a stalling mechanism, a distraction, so to speak, from the political work. Um, do you want to spend your time, if it's a limited commodity, defeating your political opponents or understanding them? Um, I, am, I am increasingly not certain that those are really as opposite as they come across. Um, David Hartman has this essay um, in, a, in a collection of, uh, of essays put out by Jonathan Sachs, I think in the 90s, called Orthodoxy Confronts Modernity. And, um, and Hartman was trying to argue for why, um, why an Orthodox rabbi ultimately creates a pluralistic institution, uh, in spite of his, the critics um, who were coming from the Orthodox community who dogged him his entire career on, on why pluralism ultimately, you know, from the perspective of his critics, was an abdication of, um, of, of, of moral conviction. And Hartman says in the piece, um, I think I'm right on a lot of things, but how could I possibly convince people that I'm right on things if I don't talk to them? <laughs> in other words, it's not like a, it, you know, he later, in other places, he does a much more principled defense of like epistemological pluralism about not being 100% right. But in, as a political tool, figuring out how to engage with the people who you disagree with, how to legitimate their humanity, 
how to understand their moral discourse is both a moral gain in and of itself, that's mostly what I talked about tonight, I think it's a huge moral gain in and of itself. I think it's overwhelming for people when they discover people who they deeply disagree with who have a moral fabric because it's much easier to caricature and characterize them as being so radically other that they don't implicate you. So it's both a moral gain in of itself, but I do also wonder whether it's also politically instrumental. If you actually want to get people to agree with you, you have to talk to them. We, we, we do not get influenced ourselves. You can study yourself. We do not usually get influenced by the prevalence of ideas in the world that are disembodied and disconnected from the human beings who bear them. We are influenced by stories, we are influenced by relationships. Consider the major political transformation that took place over the last 20 years with acceptance of LGBTQ um, human beings in the United States, which happened by and large through families and the ethics of proximity. So if we want to create cultures in which you think you are actually morally right and that your morally co moral correctness translates into political positions, we are gonna have to figure out how to do this. I am not again, and I even said this I think the night after the election, it's not about like what the forward ran a piece like the day after the election said like invite a Trump supporter for Shabbat dinner. It was a very funny piece because it was like it assumed that it had no Trump supporting readerships. Um, it's, not about, it's not about the frivolity of, um, of, of mere interpersonal relations. It's actually about a, a kind of shift of consciousness that moves us out of the performance of our loyalties and into relationships that again both create the societies in which we want to live um, and the possibilities that actually advances our politics. And you have to live with the risk that when you engage people who you think are wrong about things, you might sometimes get convinced. And I think that's one of the main obstacles why people don't really engage across difference with people of different political views, is they actually fear that someone else is gonna convince them of the legitimacy of their position. Um, if you know that, if you know that in advance, you already have some of the raw materials of ideological elasticity that are probably true for other people as well. Thank you. Um, if, if you knew Marshall Meyer, you, you, you knew that Marshall had very strong political convictions. And um, so, the, uh, the synagogue itself, which was an expression of who Marshall was partly, many of the members have strong political convictions. And in the aftermath of the election, it has led uh, uh, many to want to express their convictions through the synagogue. Not merely as Jews, but the synagogue itself should be a, um, an instrument for political action. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Um, in the presence of the rabbis, I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. So if I. Yes. Yeah. So with your permission, I would prefer to speak a little bit more theoretically than particularly for this congregation. I think that would be more appropriate. Um, um, yeah, in general. Um, look, I, um, <clears throat> I have heard, I've heard on a number of occasions in the last 10 years talking to, um, to rabbis around the country that they are no longer certain whether the synagogue that they are ministering to um, are the same denomination that it originated from um, or whether the synagogues they're ministering to have actually become a different denomination, which is a political party. Um, I know in one community somebody said to me, well, I'm, I'm Orthodox, but I, I don't go to that shul because that's the Democrat Orthodox shul. I go to this shul because it's the Republican Orthodox shul. Um, at which point, the, by the way, the adjective Orthodox is less relevant um, because in, at a certain point, then you would say it doesn't matter what the denomination actually is. I'm going to go in the places where I have, um, where I have, uh, you know, where I have my people. Um, that's part of what I'm, what I'm diagnosing as being so, so problematic. In general, I think um, the noblest rabbis who handle these issues uh, figure out how to talk about, um, how to, when they talk about politics, how to min meaningfully differentiate, if we use that spectrum, uh, 
between the moral side of a political discussion and the partisan side of a political discussion. And some rabbis get it great, and some rabbis really don't. Um, they are fortunate, the ones that don't get it, don't, don't do it well. They are fortunate that the current administration is not going to sick the tax code on them. <laughs> um, that that there, is, there actually, paradoxically now, is more freedom of the pulpit um, than there was at earlier times because, uh, because of this government's attitude towards, um, towards state and religion. Um, but it becomes crude and it becomes obvious. Um, and I, and that, doesn't, that is not an argument, I, I, apropos what I quoted from Jill Jacobs earlier, from that we should be out of the game of politics. I'm not making that argument at all. I don't know how you could talk Torah without talking seriously about politics. But what does a congregation look like that replicates what a Beit Midrash is supposed to be about when we talk about a moral fabric around politics? Where we may know, according to this, this congregation, by and large, supports Halakha Kebet Hillel. <laughs> but are we giving a, as authentic of a read as possible to Beit Shammai's position, not because we think it's right, but because it both strengthens the position of Beit Hillel to out-argue Beit Shammai, and because we have a certain epistemological humility about our, what our place is supposed to be in the world. I think one of the, one of the reasons this has gotten harder for rabbis is, um, is not because of rabbis, but it's because of lay people. <laughs> um, I don't know who, it's not, it's not rabbis going out there from rabbinical school and saying, I am seeking to be a political activist. It is oftentimes they are held accountable in very concrete ways that if they do not express political attitudes around Israel in one direction or the other, their positions are vulnerable and they are struggling. Um, I've talked to Roly extensively about this. They are struggling with the challenge of what it means to lead communities that are trying to hold them to, to these kind of accountabilities. So I would also say um, to lay people is to give your rabbis the framework and the space to be the rabbis that you actually want. Um, and in that, it means also you know, authentic protest against a political position that you don't particularly like to express in the congregation can be expressed in ways that are not simply through performance of leaving a congregation. You only leave a congregation when you feel that something has transcended your moral and your ethical boundaries. Sometimes you have to sit uncomfortably in a place and push back and turn it into the Beit Midrash that you want it to be. Thank you also for your wonderful talk. Um, we didn't spend too much time on uh, the comments by Shaul Magid, yeah. but um, he says something which, which kind of raised an issue for me. Maybe I can ask you about that. Yeah. Uh, he, he, point, he says that he thinks that religion, here, let me, let me, let me yeah. quote the sentence. He says, I argue that religion has long ceased being the primary anchor of Jewish identity for most American Jews as, and has been supplanted by three pillars, ethnicity, the Holocaust, and Zionism. To, to broaden that even further, I would say you, you, are, you are arguing that uh, our Judaism should inform our politics and our, our actions in the world. But if, if in fact, too few of us are anchored in our Judaism. Yeah. Where do you, how do you, how do you, where do you even begin? Because that's that's what concerns me. Yeah. Uh, that the politics has yeah. almost replaced, you know, this when we talk yeah. about living for a higher goal. I, I think for a lot of people that has replaced. Yes. The, what religion used yeah, to be. Yeah, and look, I think this has been true for American Jews for a long time. John Wucher writes about this as American, American Jewish um, dominant ideology in the 1950s was institutional. Building institutions, supporting institutions, and devoting those institutions towards building the state of Israel and, and ensuring the survival of the Jewish people. And the only difference now is that American Jews are more skeptical of institutions, but they are st essentially still committed to those basic norms skeptical about the content of what's supposed to happen in Jewish life, but seeking some, seeking some frameworks in which to enact um, what are basically political commitments. So you're right, that was, you know, it's part of my hypothesis tonight, is that politics has evacuated most of our other central concerns as Jews. You know, the best place to go back to to figure out what we do is all three authors that I cited, that was their main project in life. Arendt, 
Arendt insisting that the moral character of the Jewish people is not any better or any worse than any other people, but needs constant interrogation. Rosenzweig's main project in life before his life was, was tragically interrupted, and he died very young in his 30s, um, was about the revival of Jewish learning. And actually, and his great, one of his most remarkable statements where he says, we are not in a period of time in which what we need right now is the production of Jewish books. What we need more than ever are Jewish human beings. What does Jewish human beings look like means that the Jewish texture of Jewish life um, you know, is, is much more whole than the internalization of the politics um, that, I situ that I argued about before. And of course, Achad Ha'am. Achad Ha'am recognizes, as he's giving this talk in 1897 around the first Zionist Congress, we need a different plan <laughs> to solve for the Jewish problem, but the nation state itself, as he says really powerfully in this piece, the nation state itself, if the, if the, nation, if the state thinks that it is the answer to the Jewish problem itself, we will, be, we will have a state like any other. In other words, resist the idea that the story of the Jewish people is simply about the seeking of political normalcy. I know why the Jewish people gravitated towards political normalcy in the 20th century. I know why Jews in the middle of the 20th century in America said, our project has to be to render the Jewish experience normal. We have to do everything we need to do it. What we are reaping is the after effects of normalcy, which I <laughs> say like, Normalcy is not what it's cracked up to be. <laughs> so the, that's the project. It's the rehabilitation of Jewish culture, which is underinvested in. It's the rehabilitation of Jewish learning. It is the open-ended cultivation of a communal of communal batei midrash. Those activities, which actually fill the content and the vessels of Jewish human beings, enable us to resist the idea that that our entire um, essence has to be the centralization of the political. So I know there are many more questions, but we're going to close for the evening. Um, and I just want to thank you again for being part of this series and for your extraordinary remarks tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We hope to see you on Sunday evening and again on June 12th. Information about those events is in the KJ in the back and information from our economic justice is at the table on the side. Thanks for being here.